I have my dancing shoes on. That's because Al Magliano is in the house and he is one of the very first DJs in the disco era. Welcome to the show, Al. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Good. So it began 1971. Yeah. How did you become a DJ? Well, I remember it like it was yesterday. I uh, walked into a club in Brooklyn and um, I, I said to my friends, where's this music coming from? And I said, where's the jukebox? Where's the band? And they said, there's no band. There's no jukebox. They said, there's a DJ. So I said, where is he? And I walked to the back of the club and I actually saw this guy with a railroad cap on and two turntables playing these little 45s. And I basically, at that moment, I said, I have to do that. Wow. That is so much fun. Everybody's having fun. They're dancing. And since I'm not going to be the next Dick Clark, I think I could do that. That I can do. And that was a lot of fun. And for me, my inspiration was I went to go see Kramer versus Kramer, and he opened up his portfolio. And I was like, oh. And I went to art college and went into advertising only from that, like, exactly yeah. that one moment. And then the rest is, like, all kinds of, yeah. like, tapestry of That's things. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. Yeah. Uh, you have some interesting stories. One of the stories I would love for you to share is your Steve Rubell story. Oh, okay. Um, summer 1976, and um, I was in the DJ booth with a very close friend of mine, still till today. His name was Paul Casella. He was the DJ at the uh, Enchanted Garden uh, in, on Douglaston Parkway somewhere. And Steve uh, was an owner of the Steak Loft restaurants back in the day, but he also owned this club. And he said something to the effect that, uh, you know, guys, a year from now, I'm going to open up the biggest club ever. Something to that effect. And a year later, he opened up Studio 54, which was pretty... Pretty, uh, World pretty renowned, cool. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, another another fun story. Uh, people asking you to play their stuff. People w walking up before they're famous and they give you something and you play yeah, it for them. Um, you gave a lot of people their start. Yeah, I, I would say so in, 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 in my small way. Um, I was the first DJ to actually have a, 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 a test pressing of the song Push, Push in the Bush, which was a big song around 1978. And I walked into Studio 54 with this heavy test pressing and uh, with a couple other guys from the record company, which was called Prelude Records at the time. Uh, you might remember France Jolie. She records on that. Actually, I'm actually doing a show with her on Saturday night, which I could tell you about. And yeah, I walked into the club with that, and that was the first time that song was played in Studio 54. And to watch the crowd reaction was, was pretty amazing. And then you started like becoming, you had your own like fans. You would have people that would like follow you around. To, to a certain how extent, did you, yeah. How did you know... Uh, when what you were doing as a profession turned out to be something a little bit different? Well, Where the celebrity and the cachet of being a DJ started happening? You know, um, I did it for a solid 10 or 11 years. I was not a wedding DJ. I did all of my work in New York City, nightclubs or Queens or Long Island, a number of different places. And you sort of went from club to club. And the reason you did that was when your club started to go this way, you had to go to the next hot club. So you sort of developed a little bit of a reputation. And then after about 10 or 11 years, I said, you know what, I'm not going to stay in the music business. Uh, it's an extremely difficult business, although music is my absolute passion. I didn't see a path for me in that. And I really only liked doing what I was doing. That's what I enjoyed doing. So I, um, I, I stopped at some point, but again, did it for a solid 10 or 11 years. Never did a wedding or, or walked in a club. My records were all sitting there. And um, that's sort of what happened. Do you still have a large vinyl collection? I actually do. I have a DJ booth in my basement, a real DJ booth. I have a dance floor probably about as big as this. All right. And I have a disco ball that someone had given me from a club upstate that actually works. And every year I have a little bit of a disco party, and I invite many of the artists that, uh, that I've come to know. Many of them live in the New York area, so they'll come and they'll sing their hit records in my basement. And if I walk out and get struck by lightning... That night, doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter because so, you're having yeah, a great time. A, having a great time, It was yeah. funny, too, because when I interviewed Gloria Gaynor at her house, yeah. her disco ball's hanging over her billiard table. Yeah. And I was like, and we're shooting pool, and I was like, this is pretty cool, oh, yeah. you know? So uh, being true to that era and having such a great time. Now you use it uh, to what you do today. Can you tell us about what you're doing? I'm seeing events and stuff. Yeah, well, about, I don't know, maybe about eight or nine years ago, I sort of became the unofficial MC of the Tramps. The Tramps were in Saturday Night Fever, Burn Baby Burn, Disco Inferno friends with those guys many many years so one night they said why don't you do this when you come to the show you just introduce us because I pretty pretty much know everything about that group right <laughs> and it sort of morphed itself into this so I'll do shows at um, the casino and aqueduct racetrack we, I've did five done five shows there um, they're called Disco Inferno uh, at do Eisenhower Park every year I have two coming up in July um, I am also the host of the 70s Soul Jam, which is the largest R&B soul show in the United States. And that was a fluke. I walked into the uh, 
Westbury Music Fair one night to see Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes, just to say hello. It was about 5 p.m. Security guy stopped me and says, where, where are you going? I said, well, I just came to say hello to the Blue Notes. Right. And he said, oh, okay, you need to talk to her. Right. So I turned around, I see this little lady, and she says, who are you? I said, I'm just friends with the Blue Notes. I introduced them at some shows. She goes, come with me. We go into the dressing room. The Blue Notes all say hello, so she realized that I was right. really telling Legit. the truth. Right. And then we walk out after about 15 minutes, and she says, you know, I don't have an MC for the show tonight. Would you like to do it? I said, uh, okay. That was a dream come true to actually host a show at the Westbury Music Fair. That's, yes. that, that was a dream come true. And um, I was able to do four of those shows, and, and it's just, just amazing. So uh, it sort of morphed into that, and I connect myself with a couple of the producers that put these shows together, which aren't many, and I've also been able to help them find some of these artists. As a matter of fact, in the summer, we're going to bring back Cynthia Johnson. No one knows who she is, but when they hear the word Funky Town, mm -hmm. That's won't the lady who sang that song. Funky town, yeah. won't you take me to? Yeah. I'm sorry. Everything's, took, everything's music yeah. to me, right? And I found her in Minnesota. She's still living there. She's basically obsolete. People don't know who she is. If she walked out uh, into a 7-Eleven, no one would know who she is. But uh, when she starts singing, everybody She brings sing. down the house. And I'm telling you, these artists, they don't even have to sing. Yeah. Because the, uh, the, the crowd sings like every word. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's a beautiful it's, experience. It's, it's exhilarating. It right? really is. It really is. Well, we're glad that you're here. Wishing you the best of luck. Um, and I, I just want to ask you one more question. What is your very most favorite memento from your days that you just cherish so much? What is that? Hmm. What do you have that you say to yourself, you know what? If the house is on, you know, the roof's on fire, what are you grabbing? Okay. Um, I have an autographed album of the Disco Inferno album, which is, again, won a Grammy for the song Disco Inferno and Saturday Night Fever. It is displayed in my basement, and all the tramps signed it, but they signed it back in the day. And when I had my party a couple of years ago, and they were in town, and they came over, and they went in my basement, and they saw that, they looked at me like, said, you crazy? I said, this was all signed by you guys in 1977, and I, just, I put it in a beautiful frame with the record and the album cover. So there's a few more, but that would probably be the Your one that I would, I would want to take with me if I could do that. Thank yeah. you for sharing your journey right, with you're us. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Stay tuned for more on Live It Up. We're hoping you're rocking it out too. Disco Inferno, burn, baby, burn. Woo!